Okay, so one thing that's going to be very important uh, throughout all of our exercises, and you guys probably already have seen, is thinking about geographic space and thinking about environmental space or ecological space. And we're going to have to go back and forth, right? So these kind of transfers in our head and in our GIS are, are going to happen you know, for the rest of the time you work in this field. So um, just be ready for these kind of switches when we're talking about geographic space versus talking about environmental space. Do I block? Do I block anything when I'm standing here? Wow, well, you've blocked the presentation, but I mean, <laughs> so I, I should just if I you can, just if you move, they can read it. If I'm okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you're okay. All right. <coughs> Okay, so um, thank you for coming today. Our first topic is basics of niche theory and how this relates to distributions. So there are different perspectives or ways to try to study distributions and the ecological factors that drive them. And one perspective is mechanistic modeling. And this is process-based models that are based uh, usually somehow on physiology and often with lab experiments or greenhouse experiments. A very different perspective is correlative approaches that are statistical models that we can develop. And they are based not directly on physiology, but variables that somehow are related to physiology. And instead of experimental work, this is based on observations that we take from nature, observations of species occurrences, and observations of variables that we think can help us model and explain the species distribution. So this course is all about the second perspective. But it's, it's important to know that there are other ways that people are working on this, and the two, the two approaches are beginning um, to become less distinct. And um, that's something we can talk about in the discussions. So overview is we have two kinds of data. We have occurrence records, and we have environmental data. Those are somehow entered into an algorithm, and there are many, many available, which I'm sure you guys have seen lots of these. And somehow a model of the species niche is made. So is this model in geographic space or environmental space at this stage? environmental space. We've taken our data from geographic space. We're working in ecological or environmental space, and that's our model right now, okay, in the variables that we have, right? And then, but we can take that, and we can apply it to geographic space to identify the areas that are suitable for the species. And that's our goal, um, especially for a course like this where we're focusing on transfers across time and across space. Um, we don't want uh, a model that you apply to geography to identify directly where the species is found. We want to identify the areas that are suitable. The species may not occupy all of the areas that are suitable. And it's actually this difference that is, is actually very interesting uh, for, for many scientific questions that you can cover with niche models. So this is a, uh, an estimate in geographic space of the area suitable uh, in the study region uh, where the model was made and in the time period uh, of the data for which it was made. But because of the niche-based nature of the models we're trying to make, this model can be projected to other places or other time periods. So what's an example uh, you guys think of why might you want to transfer to another place? What's an application that would do that? To predict invasive species. Exactly, that's one, probably the most common one. Okay, so invasive species have been used a whole lot in the literature for this kind of transfers. And then across time, we have our future uh, climate change estimates, right, projection. And then what else is very common in the literature across time? What other uses? Yeah, so that's to the future or past? Future, okay. Uh -huh. 
Cast distributions in association with what other kinds of data? <coughs> yeah, so using paleoclimatic data to apply our model to reconstructions of past climates. And then researchers often compare that with the genetic data, right? So, especially in phylogeography. Okay? And um, these kind of transfers, this is what we're going to call transfers. These kind of transfers depend on a lot of assumptions uh, about the data you use to make the model, um, the way you make the model, and um, assumptions uh, related to the transfer itself. And so that we're going to cover today and tomorrow. So thinking again about geographic space and environmental space, we know that um, species are not always found in all the places that are suitable for them. For example, this is geographic space, X and Y are uh, latitude and longitude, for example. All of the areas um, inside these three circles are areas that are suitable for the species. And the gray in this, uh, in this graph indicates the areas that the species actually occupies. Okay? So, uh, what the uh, possible reason for why it doesn't occupy B, even though B is suitable? Sorry? Okay, there could be a competitor there. Yes? Could that competes it? Geographical barrier. There could be a geographical barrier. So, this, this unsuitable um, area uh, could be uh, a barrier for it. What else? Okay, yeah, maybe it could disperse, but uh, across this, if it has good dispersibility, but it hasn't yet done that. Okay? Um, and so someone said a uh, competitor. There's, uh, that's a great example of a whole class of uh, reasons why you wouldn't have um, a species distributed there. And, and that's why I like interactions. For example, maybe there's an important prey species uh, that's not there, or important pollinators not there. So, biotic interactions, uh, movement or dispersal related factors are uh, the two uh, classes of values, right? And then over here, we, what we do, and then these classes are the actual samples that we have, right? So, how many of you in your data set have great, fantastic, representative sampling of all of the areas that your species is found? Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe last night, maybe tonight. Right? <laughs> um, if you did, we wouldn't need to have the class, right? Um, because we don't, we have to make models and then we see what we can do to overcome that problem. So the species is found in A, but we don't have any records, okay? So nobody's gone there and sampled, but the densities are low, we don't have samples, or we just got um, information from this museum in the southern region and we don't have information from some museum in this area, we don't know. But for some reason, we only have records from the South. But we want to be able to predict all of these A regions and all those B regions. So we're taking our information uh, for whatever predictor variables, we're extracting it from geographic space, and we're plotting it here for two of those, environmental variable one and environmental variable two. So here, we have some interesting things. These are the combinations of conditions for those two variables that uh, allow the species to be present. Okay, so it can be present in, the, in these combinations of this value of environmental space and that value, and this value and that value. But up here, if it's too high on this axis or too high on that one, it can't it, it can sustain populations, right? However, if you look at the gray there, you will see that of the areas that are suitable, um, the gray doesn't encompass that whole area uh, in, in environmental space. So why might that be true? These areas of environmental space uh, that are suitable for the species are not actually occupied by the species in the real world in the lab. Why is that? Yeah, so phytic interactions, yes, for? 
or dispersal. So some of these, we don't know where, we don't know which pixels right now, but some of those white pixels in B and some of these areas here in this part of C, they correspond to environmental conditions that are different than the ones that in the gray areas, okay? Um, so imagine that the black box, um, we know because in your dreams you talked to Hutchinson, right? And he told you that, right? Or you did mechanistic experiments in the lab, and that was your circle. But our information may be a subset of that. And we may not, our occurrence uh, data, even if we have perfect occurrence data, they might not encompass the full range of the conditions that the species really can inhabit. So we have to say from the beginning, um, our models may be uh, underestimates of the species' true tolerances. Okay? Could, could it also be that we, we are using less variable space plane, the environmental space, than we should? Yeah, I mean, we are assuming that we're using variables that are important, right? Um, but I think the more variables we use, the more likely we are to have underestimates. Um, and the number of variables is something you'll see this afternoon, which can be very important to our estimates. Okay? Because we haven't talked to Hutchinson, and he hasn't told us yet what the important variables are. Okay? So, part of this is the whole endeavor is um, thinking, right, uh, and using technology, but it's also being a biologist. So, you know, making decisions based on what we know about the natural history of the species, or working with people who can tell us how to make those decisions. Okay, now let's think a little bit about our, our data and where they come from. So these are some very nice pictures from a paper by Pullen that I liked a lot. If we had a very nice, simple situation, we would have positive records from the environmental conditions that are suitable for the species, and we had, would have negative records from areas out, outside that. If we had that situation, it'd be pretty easy to make a model. However, um, often, we have records from some subset of environmental space that's suitable, right? So we have positive records uh, from the right part of the oval, and then in the left part of the oval, we see this dashed line which represents the environmental conditions suitable for a competitor, all right? And so which uh, of these species uh, seems to be the superior competitor? The one with the uh, the left oval, or the one with the, the oval that goes to the right? Yeah, so the left one is, is winning on, in the circumstances that are suitable for both. So that's reducing the, um, the observed niche, the realized niche of our focal species. So that is, that is a problem for us, okay? And you can come up with other similar examples for other biotic interactions. This situation, the third one, is also very interesting. So sources and sinks in that we have, most of our positive records are within uh, our niche space for our species, right? But we have a few outside that, because there are individuals out there wandering, trying to try out new environments, or get, trying to get to the next patch of good habitat. So occasionally, um, we have positive records in areas that are not suitable. Yes, it sinks. Yes. Um, so that's not very helpful, is it? Right? Okay. But uh, probably that um, happens in most data sets. Also, you have some uh, absences in areas that are suitable. Okay? So even if you said uh, dispersal is not a problem, there's no dispersal restrictions, what uh, why would it be with source sink dynamics that you might have an absence in areas that are suitable? Yeah. So a small patch of habitat is very suitable, but it uh, just had a population crash because some little disease came through, or you had a storm, 
or you know any of, any of those stochastic reasons, right? And it's very likely that it will be recolonized maybe next year, maybe in two years. But right now, it's great habitat, but it's just there just aren't any there. So we can have negatives inside the areas that are suitable. So that's not very helpful either, is it? Okay. So lots of challenges. And then finally. Uh, at kind of a larger geographic scale, there can be dispersal limitations. Someone had said that before on the other slide. You can have areas with great environmental conditions, um, but you don't have any individuals that have been able to get there and found a population, not enough individuals, right? So here in the Azores, can you guys think of some other species that would probably uh, be able to exist here if you had a large enough founding population? Yeah? No, no. Yeah. Oh, the only species that can live on the Azores are already here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're in the middle of the field. So exactly. It's difficult to okay. Make, yeah. So, um, one of the questions we will see, we know this is, uh, this is uh, important worldwide. Like, right? why are there no hummingbirds in Southeast Asia? You know, there probably could be, right? They'd probably be very, very happy there. But they evolved in the New World and have not dispersed to the old world, right? To that part of the old world. Okay. So, um, so the question we will see, especially tomorrow morning, is to what degree do these factors bias our records in environmental space? To what degree does our sample from the real world um, bias our representation of the species requirements in environmental <coughs> space? Because we can have noise. And if it's just random noise, kind of like this, it's not a problem. But up there, if we have something like that, that's a real signal that comes from the effects of that biotic interaction. And that is really going to affect our model. 